us through a case series, actual patients, and hopefully they'll bring out the, the points that we want to, to share. Um, let me share my screen and, and we can start. Right, so um, we want to look at managing retinal vein occlusions, and that is a sum total of central retinal vein, branch retinal vein. Uh, I will not go into diagnosis, um, that is assumed. Um, so our learning objective is to look at the benefit of early and immediate anti of injection. Uh, then to look at the need for sustained and regular injection protocol, because that's very important. And then to demonstrate what is treat and extend protocol and how that looks like in real clinical practice. Uh, and then how to manage non-responders, because they will be non-responders. And then show proof that if you inject one eye anti vegf it affects the other eye. We have proof of that. And then um, retinal vein occlusions and cataract surgery, which uh, is a common issue that we all face. So case number one, uh, just allow me to figure out, okay. So case number one, we are looking at the benefit of early and immediate anti-VEGF in injection. And we will see, um, hold on, my screen has, right. So this was uh, a lady who presented to us last month um, she's 92 year old, fairly healthy. She's hypertensive. And why she came is she had a sudden painless vision loss, which is a typical thing in retinal vein occlusions. She was not on blood thinners, which is important. She was not diabetic. She had no previous history of any eye problems. On presentation, she was 660 uh, and left eye was 69. Uh, IOP was normal. And she had a retinal vein, she had a central retinal vein occlusion in the right eye and the left eye was normal. Now, visual acuity is an important indicator. Once you have poor vision, that usually shows ischemic. That is one of the indicators that tells you whether it is ischemic or non-ischemic. The other thing that tells you whether it's ischemic is a, uh, an RAPD. So unfortunately, sometimes you don't know that it's an CRVO and then you've already dilated. So it's always good to have a look first before you dilate. Uh, alternatively, try and do your pupil reflexes all the time. But when, where, you know, you have um, paramedics helping you with the visual equity and those things, sometimes they get dilated and you lose it. But RAPD is also a good indicator to show you whether you're dealing with an ischemic or an ischemic. Now, if you look at the OCT, the line is beyond what the graph allows. Uh, it's way up there, really, really severe macular edema. The whole thing is just red. And so we then uh, started treatment. We gave her ILEA immediately. Um, we noted her blood pressure was a bit high. And so this is now the visit a month later. And, and this is the scan a month later. So when we saw her in Feb, on that same day, we gave her an injection of ILEA. And she came back four weeks to get the second ILEA. And you can see vision has improved from 618 to 6, I mean, from 660 to 618. The scan is almost normal. There are a few red dots there, but generally okay. The black line is her retinal thickness, which is normal and she is in extremely uh, happy. And so she then got the second idea um, when she came in March. Well, it's not this month, no, it was last month. And she is scheduled for another in, in four weeks. So we see when you get retinal vein occlusion, a fresh retinal vein occlusion, whether it's branch retinal or central retinal vein, if you treat it immediately, you get very remarkable results. And so time is of essence between when you start and when they present. Uh, unfortunately, some of them present much later, but when they present, try and start treatment immediately. And if it's an issue of they can't afford idea or they can't afford this, even a vastin is good enough, but give anti vegf that day if possible, because that is one of the major, major contributors of outcome. They respond very quickly, and the patients, of course, are very motivated because they see that result, so they will come. So that's, that's the first learning point. The second learning point is to, to demonstrate the need for sustained and regular injections. That means do, do, not, uh, do not give the impression to the patient that you're going to get three injections and all will be well. 
It doesn't work like that. It never works like that. You, you need to be very, very clear that this is a long-term process. You're looking at, uh, I think that there was a study that showed that on average patients will need eight injections in one, in one year. So that's what I tell my patients. I tell my patients average is eight injections in one year. You may need four, you may need 12 because if the average is eight, it means some patients took four, some patients took eight. That usually makes their jaw drop, especially when they calculate the cost. But it is a good thing because then they, they face the reality quickly and, and, and you can have that discussion on what modality you're going to use. But patients think you're going to give them a few injections and then it will be over. It's very important to, to clarify that quickly. So this is a 50 year old uh, female patient who presented to us in September 2020, last year. Uh, and she came because she had this shadow. She, she, she wasn't sure what it is, but she knew there was something wrong with her left eye. She had borderline blood sugars. She was very, very hypertensive and she had just come from a cardiologist in, in, in <laughs> that same day. Her vision was 618 uh, in, the, in the right eye and the left eye was 624. Pressures were normal. She had quite high astigmatism, um, but on correction, the left eye was not improving with refraction. So we, we did an OCT and, and we found uh, macular thickening but the bulk, the bulk of the edema and the, and the bleeding was actually superior to the, to the macula. So she had a branch retinal vein occlusion, which was just involving the, the, the macula. And that's why she was not really complaining about vision, but a shadow. In any case, um, we gave her ILEA the same day. Um, and, uh, and she then came, or rather we booked her for ILEA in four weeks. Uh, which is usually kind of the standard protocol. We give three injections four weeks apart. Um, and then, so she then came in October and in October, she was elated. Vision was 6'9". Uh, her OCT was back to normal. There was still a bit of swelling up there somewhere, but generally the four-year zone was perfect, uh, normal thickness. Her vision was now even better than the other eye. She got the second ilia uh, in October and she was booked because her response was so good. We thought, well, let's try and extend a bit. So we gave her eight weeks, uh, seeing how she had responded. And she was a very uh, responsible person, well-educated. You know, we had a long talk and we decided, you know what, let's try and give it eight weeks. Well, turns out that uh, she didn't come. She then appeared on the 14th of uh, January, uh, 14 weeks uh, after the last injection, instead of eight weeks. And lo and behold, vision was back to where it started 624 and the macular edema was now even worse. Uh, so you have very, very severe macular edema. The thickening is, is back, vision is down. Her blood pressure is still way up there, very poorly controlled. The sugars are still not well controlled. So, so we see the effect of a non-sustained approach. So this is where the time interval was too long and, and, and you, you lose all the, all the gains you had, you had gained, all the momentum you had done. And if, you, if this happens, you also find that the vision actually never comes back to the initial. Each time you lose, you lose a line. So it's very important to maintain that momentum because even the vision, uh, then you'll be able to maintain it. But if you have these long breaks, uh, then each, each time you, you try and come back, it doesn't quite come back to where it was. Well, she, things were, it is as it was. So she came, we gave her an injection um, uh, at, that, at that point in January uh, and explained to her to really try and get her act together. Uh, and she came in March um, and, you know, retina was perfect, completely well, very, very happy. And now, you know, we then gave, gave uh, her for, we booked her for the fourth idea. Now, since we had stayed for so long, and since her response is always so good, we said, look, why don't we try and uh, extend this thing and see whether you'll be able to survive for 12 weeks. So she's due for 12 weeks, which is three months, and we want to see uh, whether, um, you know, she can survive. We know that 14 weeks, which is how the length she stayed, will not work. So now we are looking at 12 weeks. Can we extend it for 12 weeks? And if she comes at 12 weeks and she's still normal, we will give her the injection and probably maintain her 12 weeks because we know 14 weeks did not work. But the point of this patient is to show that you can get very good responses. And if you then take this long break, 
it will just come back and usually it will come back worse and you can very easily lose all the gains that, that you had that you had achieved. So that's that's uh, a case for you know don't don't lose momentum, don't get tired, keep the injections as per the schedule because then you will you will get a good result. Case number three, we want to talk, want to talk about um, treat and extend. Now, a bit of history. So in the in the studies, the studies were usually done every four weeks, every every month basically. And unfortunately, in the real world, that doesn't that just does not happen. So they then moved to PRN. PRN is you give the initial three, then the patients come and uh, you do an OCT. If it's okay, you tell the patient to go home. If it's not, you inject. Problem with that is that when the patient comes to the clinic, they don't know whether they're going to get an injection or not. And for the people in the clinic, they don't know how many injections they have today because we are all waiting to do the OCTs and decide whether you need an injection or not. So in terms of logistics, it's very, very difficult. And then real life data showed that PRN, you, the outcomes are much worse than, uh, than the monthly dosing. So the treat and extend is a compromise to say, can we find halfway ground where we are not giving every month, but we are not doing PRN because PRN shows very poor results. So let me go to the case and, and then we'll discuss. So case number three, these are 52 year old diabetic hypertensive who presented to us on the March of 2019. So when he came, uh, he was counting fingers, uh, both, both counting fingers one meter both eyes and with correction, it was 624 and 66. So he was quite a high myope and he had normal IOPs. Um, he had cystoid macular edema, he had no exudates, he had no hemorrhages. It was not the typical diabetic uh, retinopathy. So it, it seemed to me that this was, you know, not a real fresh uh, branch retinal vein. It had stayed there a bit, but it was obviously a branch retinal vein occlusion. So we gave him ILEA April, 2019. We gave him another ILEA in May, 2019. Two weeks after the, 20, the male injection, he came back with pain and photophobia, and we were very worried whether he has, uh, he's developing endophthalmitis, but there was no sign of endophthalmitis. So we thought he had just developed an iritis. We treated him from, with Maxidex for two weeks and it cleared and he was happy, but uh, he then uh, disappeared. Now, we don't know, maybe he got scared by that incident. So we, we lost him to follow up. Um, and at that point, um, his vision was uh, 618. So he then appeared in October. So remember it's from May. So we, we did him in May, two weeks he came with pain. Then he was supposed to come back. Now he just disappeared. Came back in October, uh, which in effect is four months later. And we were back to square zero. Um, the, the swelling was back, everything was, you know, haywire. so we started again. So ILEA number one in October, ILEA number two in November, ILEA number three in December 2019. Um, and then in April, he disappeared again. Uh, in April, uh, it, it, uh, the macular edema recurred. So we then uh, started the same again, uh, three ILEAs every month. So we did May, June, and July and the macula was dry. So vision was 6'6". Six, six. Uh, he was, I mean, everything was looking good. So at this point, we had a long chat and said, look, you, you can't be coming when you want. There is a program here. We have done every four weeks. Your macula is looking good. Your vision is normal. We are then now going to extend. So we know four weeks, we've dried your retina. We are going to extend now to two months. The next injection is going to be in two months. And then we will see whether two months is okay, whether you, you're still fine. So we agreed. Um, and, uh, and so two months, uh, he came back, macula is dry. We gave him an injection, even though the macula was dry. We gave him an injection uh, and uh, we said, fine, Let, let's try and now extend it by three months. So the last injection is November. We said, come back in three months and we are going to see whether uh, you still have a dry macula. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're dry, we'll then give you an injection and we'll extend again for four months. So the, the idea is you, you keep extending by a month. Some people extend it by two weeks, but the important thing is that when the patient comes, you give an injection, irrespective of what is happening, you give an injection. If the macula is dry, then you extend it. If the macula is not dry, then you know you have extended it for too long. 
So you, you back up either by a month or by two weeks, depends on what protocol you use. But you, you, you give until you give until the macula is dry every four weeks, then you extend two months. That, that's the way I do it. Then I'll extend by three months, then I extend by four months. But you keep injecting at every patient encounter. So now this was November. We said, come back in three months. We'll do the OCT and see whether you've been able to stay for three months. So uh, the man came, came back. He, he extended a bit, but, but not too long. But lo and behold, macular edema was back. So now we know that we cannot extend for this gentleman really beyond two months because at three months, he recurs. So once you determine the, 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 the time period where he is able to stay dry, then now going forward, you just inject every two months. You don't even think twice. We know he cannot stay for three months. Uh, we know that he is able to stay for two months because we were monitoring the extended progress. So now he's at two months injection until further notice. Hopefully after three or four or five injections, we'll then say, look, let's try and extend this. So that's how treat and extend happens. One, you do, you give the injections, whatever you're giving until the macula is dry, and then you start extending. And you give at every point as you extend and look for where the macula edema will come back. And then you back off backwards by two weeks or whatever you decide, and then you maintain the patient there. That is the typical treat and extend. What that means is that you have uh, pushed the patient to the longest duration that is safe, and then you maintain it there instead of PRN and instead of the monthly injections. So that's case number three, and hopefully we'll see how, how he does. So what about those people where you give and you give and you give and they don't respond? What, what do you do? Um, so let me discuss this case. I apologize for the quality of the scans. I had to photocopy this because I didn't have the soft copies. So this man came to us in 2017. He's a 73-year-old male. He's diabetic. He's hypertensive. Right eye was counting fingers four meters. Left eye was normal. He had an RAPD in the right eye. So already that tells you poor vision, RAPD. This is ischemic. We gave him a vaccine on the 10th of October, on the 7th of November, on the 5th of December. Uh, sorry, this is... Uh, there's a typo there. And he basically did not uh, respond and, and January 2018, and basically there was no response. The, the, the retina stays the same, um, nothing happened. And we were sure of the, of the diagnosis. So now what do we do? So once we got an unresponse, uh, we then said, okay, let's, let's uh, go to a steroid. So we gave him Ozidex uh, in 2018. And at that point, we also did PRP uh, and Avastin. So we gave him Ozidex. Two weeks later, we did a PRP and Avastin. And lo and behold, the edema went. His vision really, really improved. Um, and things were looking good. So that was February 2018. Now, I don't have the, the scan, but this, this scan, I don't have both, but this scan that you're seeing was after the Ozidex. So we, we know it's the Ozidex that did this. But because uh, we know this is an ischemic uh, CRVO, we also did a PRP and gave him a vaccine. And his daughter is a very motivated person, so she wanted him to have everything possible. So everything is looking good. Um, the macular edema started recurring. He got another OZDEX in April. Then he then developed a dense posterior subcapsular because of the steroid. We did a FECO and uh, I think a FECO and a vaccine in July. 2018, he was 636, day one post stop. The macular edema recurred, as it always does after cataract surgery. We gave him Ozidex in August. Um, we gave him Lucentis in October. We gave him ILEA in November. Uh, vision stayed at 636. And at that point, we said, okay, things are looking fine. At least the edema has gone. He has a bit of vision from counting fingers. Then, um, he got five ileas in 2019 uh, as, a, as a treat and extend, and he got one OCDEX, basically the whole year. But then um, in 2020, he, he, this was the picture, the whole year. He got very many patisras, and he, I think he also got an OCDEX in March. 
and this was just not resolving. This cyst-like uh, swelling was just not going. And so by the end of the year, we were getting frustrated and we were thinking, okay, now do we stop or do we not? What do we do? Uh, and Mushai had this bright idea and decided, why don't we try ILEA again? Uh, before we give up on this gentleman. So in December last year, we then gave him a year. After getting uh, Renibizumab almost every two months for the whole year, we then said, okay, let's try ILEA. And we, we gave him ILEA. And lo and behold, this is what happened. So this was December. We gave him ILEA. He came in January. His edema was gone. Uh, and he got another ILEA. And so far, his edema has completely gone and his vision has improved. So we see a case where um, one thing works, then after some time it stops working. And the thing to do is to then change to another agent. It doesn't matter what agent it is. Uh, and also try your combinations. If you've tried one anti-VEGF and you've tried another and it doesn't work, then give a, give a try of steroids. Now, this is a case where the steroids work and then after some time it refused to work. And also that steroid then gave him a cataract. So you've got to remember, once you enter into steroids, then you, you develop cataracts and you need to counsel the patient. Otherwise the patient gets upset and, and blames you for his cataract. If they are pseudophagic, then, then you're safe. Uh, but so before we, we dismiss somebody as a non-responder, try a different agent. Uh, and this is a good case that demonstrates how uh, that, that has worked for him. Um, now, why didn't we go to Avastin? Well, we thought, you know, maybe the best we have is Ilya Lestra and give him, give him that, but, and this has worked. But you can see he has gotten the whole, um, everything, everything we have, we have given him. So um, the first time I saw this was about two years, three years back, and I, I was convinced that I'm, I'm making it up. In that, that was a patient who had diabetic macular edema in both eyes. And I gave him an injection in one eye. And when he came back in a month, both his eyes were dry. And I thought that cannot be. And I thought this guy probably got an injection somewhere or did something. But, you know, he seemed an honest man. So I presumed that there must have been systemic in, uh, absorption. But I, I, I could, I, I just, I talked myself out of it. I said, no, that's not possible. Uh, well, so here is a case. Um, this is a 65-year-old man, uh, has been hypertensive for the last five years. He presented in April 2018, 618 both eyes. At that point, he had an old superior branch retinal vein in the left eye with NVEs, and he had a fresh bleed. So left eye, old BRVO, he's already developing new vascularization. He has a bit of a bleed. Um, so I said, look, um, this blood is not too much. Um, come back in three months, let's wait for the blood to clear and, and then we will do a PRP. It, the, the neovascularization was not a lot, it was just a few tufts. And I said, look, instead of rushing and trying to do a PRP and I don't have a good view, let's give this uh, vitreous blood some time to clear because it's not too much. That is 2018. So, uh, and he then disappeared, basically. He, he never came back. I presume the vitreous hemorrhage cleared, he had back his vision and he didn't see the need to come. So he then appears in September 2020 last year with now the right eye, which was his you know, good eye at 660 and the left eye had motion. Uh, so now we've got a problem. Uh, the, the bad eye, the previously bad eye is really bad, HM, and his good eye now is very bad. And the IOP was uh, basically normal both eyes. So when I saw him in his good eye, he had a central retinal vein occlusion with cystoid macular edema, and the left eye now had a total vitreous hemorrhage. Obviously, the neovascularization must have continued to increase because he never came back for laser. Uh, at this point now, he was really desperate, and, you know, and there were issues, it was COVID, he had been laid off, didn't have money, didn't have insurance, he was a foreigner. So, you know, difficult situation. But so now here we are, central retinal vein, right eye, which is his better eye, and a total vitreous hemorrhage in the left. So um, I said, OK, uh, your left eye looks like it will probably need surgery. But uh, let's, uh, let's see what we can do. So we gave him a vastin in the right eye. Um, and a month later, we gave him a vastin in that uh, um, 
right eye, which was his better eye. But in the meantime, the vitreous hemorrhage in the left cleared. So his vision improved. Uh, so remember, we are giving a vastin in the right eye and the full vitreous hemorrhage clears and it clears very quickly. And it was a full vitreous hemorrhage. I did not give much thought to that. I just thought, well, vitreous hemorrhage is clear. So, you know, you know, good for him. We were concentrating really on the right eye. So uh, we are now in a vastin, um, second injection in the right eye. Um, and uh, then the left eye develops another vitreous hemorrhage uh, while we are dealing with the right eye. So we give him um, a vastin right eye, the third injection, and now we have to think about what to do with this vitreous hemorrhage that has recurred. That is December. Then he comes back in February and uh, the, the, the left eye vitreous has cleared. So I told him, look, since this vitreous hemorrhage is recurring, we now have a window. We really need to take, uh, forget about this right eye first. We need to deal with your left eye quickly. I, we have a view, let's do PRP and a vastin. And then we will sort out your right eye later. And he agreed. So we did PRP and uh, a vastin in the left eye, this eye that uh, retina looks no more. Meanwhile, the right eye is just uh, festering and getting worse, very, very swollen. So we then see him um, a few weeks later to try and you know, now plan for the, for the right eye and uh, be, and um, what happens? Oh, yes, this is, uh, this is now when he comes back. So after we did PRP left eye, he then came back a month, a month later and he had improved in, in the right eye. The edema was gone. Uh, well, it wasn't gone, but it was much better. He was much happier. But all we did is inject Avastin in the left eye. Now, I, there is no way this edema can improve by itself. So uh, it, it, the, the Avastin in the left eye must have had a, a, a systemic effect somehow on, on the right eye and, and help the edema to resolve. And probably that is also what was happening when we were giving Avastin in the right eye the vitreous hemorrhage would clear in the left. And so I, I don't know whether it is systemic, I don't know how that works, but it is. this is the second patient I have seen where clearly you give an anti vegf in one eye and you see the effect of that anti vegf in the other eye. Now, this patient also presents with an interesting uh, uh, case because one, uh, bilateral retinal vein occlusions are rare, but obviously here is a case where it, it has happened. Uh, and that two retinal vein occlusions left alone will give you neovascularization. And this is the case in point. And three, vitreous hemorrhage, if it's not a lot, can resolve spontaneously. Now, what is a lot? Uh, I guess that comes by experience. Uh, but uh, yes, if it's a mild vitreous hemorrhage and they don't bleed again, it will, it will resolve. Um, CRVO macular edema. Usually it is extreme. Uh, it is not uh, like the first cases I showed. It's usually recurrent. Uh, use whatever anti vegf you have. Prepare for very many injections. And as soon as you have a good view, please do PRP. Remember CRVO is a very ischemic event, extremely. So PRP helps to reduce the ischemic drive and hopefully reduce the number of injections or at least get a better response. In CRVOs, you really must do a PRP. Uh, it's not just anti vegf that you're dealing with. So what about uh, when you need to do cataract surgery in a previous BRVO or CRVO patient? Uh, and usually because of the age or because of the steroids, the cataract, if it's not there, it's gonna develop and if it's there, it's gonna get worse. So this was a patient who had um, a, a BRVO in 2017 got seven of us in the one IVTA. 2018 got three ideas. Basically, um, the macular edema was gone, so she was just on maintenance. She had a stable vision of 624. We did not see her 2019, she didn't come. In 2020, she got very severe COVID, was in ICU, and then noticed that uh, she's not seeing very well. So after she, was, she recovered, she came and the uh, vision was hand movement basically. And she had a dense white uh, cataract. Um, and so we then um, did a small incision. We, can't, we couldn't even do FACO uh, on February this year. And she was very happy. Day one post-op was 636. She was very, very happy. 
And then a month later, she came and, and she complained and said, look, my vision is not as good as it was. Day one, uh, you know, uh, things are not clear. The vision had dropped to counting fingers. And when we did an OCT from a dry macula, she now had, um, you know, significant macula edema, which is something that almost always happened uh, with retinal vein or branch retinal vein. You do a cataract surgery, please expect the macula edema to recur. <laughs> And please cancel the patient because they usually will blame you. They will say it is your fault. So if you know that this is a, a vascular occlusion patient, uh, preempt and tell them, look, we expect that the macular edema is going to recur. And since it's going to recur, then you really need to give something intra-op. You can give your IVTA if that's what you have. You can give your Avastin, but inject something in there because uh, if you don't, the macular edema is going to be very, very severe. And it's usually very difficult to treat. So the, the, the natural reaction of a retinal vein occlusion after cataract surgery is that the macular edema recurs. Now, the mechanism for that, I presume it's some inflammation and, and mediated stuff, but that is for the scientists. May I tell you what happened? Um, so in summary, best outcomes happen when you give anti-VEGF as soon as possible after the RVO happens. The time of year is really of essence. That's I think is one of the, um, that is what determines good outcome. How quickly do you start treating? Um, if you skip injections, the CME will come back uh, almost invariably. Um, take some time to cancel the patient. You, you can't just give a diagnosis and tell them you're going to treat because they think that you're treating and they'll be fine. Uh, that, that's a natural reaction of, of a patient. So please cancel the patient to explain that this is two, three year, four year, uh, you know, treatment, you're gonna do these injections for a long time. Probably you will never stop. Uh, and what we are looking at is to extend the injection so that you get as minimum, as the least per year as possible. That list may be two, it may be three, it may be four. You don't know because you don't know where your treat and extend is gonna uh, end up, but you know, that, that's, that's the idea. And please, um, you know, please cancel the patient because that is what leads to patient's disappointment. They think that you, you, you are just looking for money. You're giving injections needlessly. Uh, so counseling is very important. Uh, after you've given um, and there's no improvement, change, change the agent. Now, we, 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 the traditional thing was three months, but now there are discussions that non-responders should not be, that decision should not be made before you've given six injections. But, you know, that's your call. If they're not responding, um, you know, change to something else. Don't, don't throw up your hands and say there's nothing that can be done. Try and uh, get to treat an extent because that, that's what is known to work and that's what will help you achieve the least number of injections but effective uh, for that patient. I usually extend in a month. There are some people who extend in two weeks. Uh, that's your call. I think a month works. But you cannot extend before you have achieved dryness. If you have not achieved a dry macula, then you can't extend because that's, that's kind of illogical. Uh, you, you dry the macula and then you start extending to see how far can you go with an uh, injection-free uh, period. Uh, um, cataracts, if they are there, they'll get worse because of the steroids. And if they're not there and you give steroids, they're gonna come. So please warn the patient. Uh, but at that point, it, you don't really, it doesn't really matter. Um, you, you need to treat the retina. I think the, the biggest problem is really for the, for the glaucoma patients and steroids. Because, and remember, glaucoma is one of the predisposing uh, issues. But as you've seen in all our cases, there's actually no glaucoma patients, but glaucoma is a major cause of all this. So when you have glaucoma and you're, then you need to use steroids, I would uh, probably refer the patient to Sheila and let her deal with that matter because then, then, then you can be in a real problem. Um, well, Sheila or any glaucoma specialist, I know Kiaga and the others are here, so let's uh, raise a war cry. Um, so if, if you have a diabetic, if you have a glaucoma patient with a retinal vein occlusion, you probably need to consult with the glaucoma people before you give steroids. Um, and then cataract surgery will worsen the CME. If it's there, it will get worse. If it's not there, it will come back. So please preempt it, plan for it, and, and, and cancel the patient. Uh, and finally, uh, injections never really stop. Um, you're not looking for an injection-free uh, time, especially in central retinal vein occlusion. 
you probably will need two or three injections per year uh, if you are going to maintain the vision that you have uh, been able to to recoup. Yeah, thank you very much. We shall you over to you. Okay, I think you can stop sharing your slides. Oh, uh, hang on, how do I do that? Um, yes, okay. excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kibata, for that very insightful talk on vascular occlusions. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm happy to hear that, you know, I, we, I am not alone in this battle because, I mean, I have patients who I have given one injection of ILEA. There's a patient I had one bilateral CRVO, and the previous eye had been treated with steroids several years prior. Now there was ILEA, and with one injection, his edema melted and disappeared, and that was it. Then he went abroad and I told him to follow up with his retina surgeon there. And I have another patient who we have so far given 17 Lucentis, four Ozudex, and we are now on the fourth ILEA. Same condition. So I think you really have to take time to you know, know that your patients are going to respond differently to the treatment. And I think another important pointer when we are talking about vascular occlusions is to remember that this patient primarily is probably not even your patient because they have often underlying conditions. Uh, glaucoma alone probably times five risk of vascular occlusions, but you also have to consider are they diabetic, are they hypertensive, especially the hypertension. Do they have raised homocysteine? Do they have coagulation disorders? Um, you know, do they have polycythemia? We have seen all these things. So I think always getting down to find out what is their underlying condition if there is one and referring accordingly. So that if it's a hypertension, a hypertensive patient, a cardiac patient, then they're following up with the relevant physician as well. Um, I think vascular occlusion treatment has come a long time from the early studies of you know, giving lasers, you know, grid lasers, macular lasers, where we really expected no improvement. So I think, um, you know, the injections uh, in terms of anti vegf steroids have really done a lot to, to get us to where we are now. Now, I want to look at some of the questions that have been posted here uh, for Dr. Gibata. Um, and I think the first question here is posted by Dr. Kahaki, and she says that, Dr. You seem to favor ILEA for retinal vascular occlusions. Is there any particular reason for this? So, uh, Kahaki, as, as you've seen, we give everything. We have given Avastin, we have given uh, Ranibizumab, we've given Patizra, we've given IVTA, we've given. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just that I think it just happened that a lot of the cases I presented were from the AP clinic. And the AP clinic, they come and say, I want the German one. <laughs> so they, they, they've already Googled, they've already decided what they want to have. Uh, but, um, you know, I have no uh, financial, I am not a shareholder. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but we also find that um, ILEA responds very well. So in the general side, we, we usually will start with Avastin, although there's a discussion now whether we really should be starting with Avastin we find that ILEA really responds well. And this is not because of any relationship. Uh, I say, if it was my mother with a BRVO, I would give ILEA because of the response. And also you're able to extend, I think you're able to extend fairly far with ILEA uh, as compared to the others. But use what you have, they work. Um, I, I have no problem at all. All right, thank you. Now, there's a question from Dr. Walia. Now, this, before I ask this question, I think I need to give some background. There's a Dr. Heyre, who's an uh, ophthalmologist of great repute and who has done a lot of research into vascular occlusions. He's studied them from every angle possible. And his recommendations were at some point thought to be quite controversial. Uh, some of them have found out to be right, some not so much. So the question from Dr. Walia, he says there's a large trial by Dr. Heyre, and the teaching was for vascular occlusions, wait and watch for new vessels, raised pressures in form of, I'm guessing, neovascular glaucoma, and when they start suffering visual loss and you know, loss of pupil reactions. Now, he's asking, does that change? And I think it's because a lot of the research done by Dr. Heyre originally was before the era of uh, anti-VEGFs. 
So what's your take on that particular teaching of Dr. Hira that for vascular occlusion, wait until you get neovascularization and raised IOPs. Yeah, I, I think I can say unequivocally that there's also a teaching by Dr. Kibata, don't wait. <laughs> Absolutely don't wait, please. So, so, so let, let's look at uh, why do patients, um, why is the vision loss in branch retinal vein occlusions? The vision loss is from diabetic macular edema. The I mean, not the not diabetic, uh, the cystoid macular edema. The cystoid macular edema is what drops their vision. Now, if you wait on cystoid macular edema, it does not get better. In fact, there's a meta-analysis that has just come out. I think it came out today or yesterday uh, from uh, the Cochrane, Cochrane Library on, on uh, there's somebody who's done a meta-analysis on the natural progression of retinal vein occlusion. And they, they show very clearly that you, the macular edema gets worse, you will get neovascularization along the road, especially CRVOs, uh, and, and generally your vision gets worse. Your vision does not improve. So, so knowing that diabetic, I mean, uh, the cystoid macular edema is what gives the patient the patient's poor vision. The, the way to treat uh, the macular edema is the anti or steroid. And like Mushai says, a lot of that teaching comes from pre 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 steroid pre anti uh, era. We also know that the, the, the macular edema is ischemic driven because they, are, they, they have measured the VEGF in those patients. And CRVO has about 10 times the level of VEGF compared to diabetic. So CRVO is an extremely ischemic condition. So you want to laser that patient and laser to the, so my laser is usually to the arcade. We laser until we can laser no more because otherwise it continues driving the, 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 the ischemia. So I would say unequivocally, that is not the way to go. That's not the way to treat. Uh, please inject quickly and for CRVOs, treat, inject. Maybe for BRVOs, you can wait and see whether you're going to get neovascularization and then you do PRP. I think that is reasonable. I generally will PRP them because when they get neovascularization, they will come with a tractional detachment and then it's me who will have to sort it out. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I agree with the BRBOs. There's always the issue of whether to wait and watch, establishing if it's ischemic or not, especially if you don't have a OCT angiography or a fluorescent angiography. And, you know, in this setting, sometimes it's just better to laser them almost, you know, prophylactically because eventually they come with vitreous hemorrhage and that traction is true. I think I had two cases this week and they become quite difficult to treat at that point. Um, there's a question by Dr. Ashok Kumar Shah. He says he has a 38-year-old, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive with branch vein occlusion with macular edema confirmed on OCT. So his question is, what would be your first line of treatment, given that his vision is 618, not improving in that eye? To, com to add to that question, Dr. Oscar Onyango has made a comment uh, where he says, consider a vasculitis and coagulopathy workup. What more would you have to say for that case, uh, Dr. Kibata? Sorry, Mushai, you lost me a bit. Uh, so it was, I'm trying to 38 think. year old, yeah. non-diabetic, non-hypertensive BRVO oh, with yeah. macular 618 vision. So he's asking what would be your first line B? And to add to his question, Oscar Onyango mentions that he should also consider doing a vasculitis and coagulopathy workup as he considers how to treat this patient. <clears throat> what would be your first line of treatment for this patient? So, so first of all, I, I, I agree with Oscar. Uh, where you don't have obvious uh, comorbidities and in young people with a BRVO, that is very worrying. Uh, uh, you, are, you, you, you look for, uh, you know, vasculitis, you look for coagulopathies, you look for sickle cell, you look for everything. Work up that patient completely because young people with a BRVO, you really have to be careful uh, that, that, uh, that you've got some serious um, uh, uh, systemic issues. Once your macula is involved, the co the, it, it enters a common pathway. Once you have macula edema, then it's, you have to assume it is ischemic and, uh, and treat it as any ischemic macular edema. Uh, if the BRVO is extensive, and especially in young people, I'll probably laser it as well. Because remember, you don't have a PVD at that point, so PVD is gonna develop, and when it develops, you're going to get a traction detachment. 
So I would I would laser without waiting too much. So the, the, the common path, once you enter the common path, the treatment is the same. But the worrying case here is a 38 with a BRVO, uh, not diabetic and non-hypertensive, that's a reason to, to really worry. So I would send them to the physician and talk to the physician first and tell them, look, this guy has a stroke. Uh, why? Because they understand stroke. Once you tell them, <laughs> and even the patient. So actually, that's the other thing. I tell them what you have is a stroke of the eye, and you can have a stroke of the brain, and you can have a stroke of the heart. Uh, so you, we really need to control your blood sugar. Then they get it. All right. There's if I may a... just add here, uh, Dr. Kibata, Dr. Shire again. The blood works, everything was normal. The physicians have cleared him as perfectly normal. That puts us into a rather difficult situation as to what line of management to now go for. Well, doctor. Oh, hi, doctor. hi, Ashok. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Yes, Mushai, Mushai, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, as, as you're saying, sometimes you cast your net very wide you know, doing things even down to things like serum homocysteine, which is seen to be elevated in quite a number of patients with vascular occlusions. Right. But in up to 20% of patients with vascular occlusions, you actually don't find a risk factor. True. And therefore, you treat the eye. And uh, if something is hiding somewhere, it might eventually come out or nothing might ever come out. So you treat the <laughs> eye. <at that> point. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question by Dr. Jaffaji, where he asks, what are your thoughts on sensitizing slash resensitizing an anti-VEGF with a steroid? Yeah, that is difficult English. What, what does he mean? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Dr. Jaffaji can unmute himself yeah. and tell us about yeah. this sensitization with steroids. Dr. Jaffaji. I'm Mushai, Dr. Kibata, how are you? Fine, fine. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and moderating. Uh, and uh, we are enjoying the, the to and fro discussions. What I mean is sometimes you are giving the anti-VEGF and the patient is, was initially responding and then they are not responding. And then sometimes you give them the VEGF, anti-VEGF with a steroid. Maybe they're having a tachyphylactic effect or something like that. And now they actually start responding to that uh, to the anti-VEGF. Ever tried anything like that? Got any any good response with that? Well, usually, usually when they don't respond to the anti-VEGF, we give the steroid, and then when they respond, we ascribe it to the steroid. Are you saying you give them concurrently the same sitting, or you give one and then you 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 take a break, give a steroid, and then continue with the anti-VEGF? Uh, actually, you give it concurrently. Like sometimes what I do, you see a patient has been responding to an avastin and then he's not. So I give him some dexamethasone along with it. And uh, Intravitreal. Uh, intravitreal, yes. And they actually start now responding to the avastins again. Okay. That must now be called the Shafiq protocol. <laughs> <laughs> we shall try it. You know, as you mentioned... As you mentioned, uh, we leave the science to the scientists. <laughs> Me, I'm reporting what I get. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Ah, that's, that's food for thought. And I guess we can read around it, try it out, and see how that works. We are open to new ideas every day, especially when it comes to vascular occlusions, because they are so difficult to treat. Now, there's a, a comment here from Dr. Sheila Marco. And you know, it is not on glaucoma. She's asking about patient with mild vitreous hemorrhage, the, one of the cases presented where you got a response in the other eye. So she asks, would giving a VEGF in the case of vitreous hemorrhage due to vascular occlusion help the vitreous hemorrhage clear faster so that then you're in a position to do the laser later? So I want to comment on this because we, we have had a few disasters from uh, Diaspora. Uh, diaspora is non retinal colleagues in this case. So um, if you have a vitreous hemorrhage um, and you give anti vegf you are assuming that it was neovascularization, which is probably correct, but you have no idea how long ago 
um, or rather you don't know whether they are membranes or not. So um, you, you can have a vitreous hemorrhage because of a PVD that uh, avast a blood vessel. And you can have a vitreous hemorrhage because you have new blood vessels that are, that are bleeding. Um, in, in, in BRVOs, sometimes both are happening at the same time. But now what happens is you give an anti vegf when the vitreous hemorrhage finally clears, you have this horrible traction detachment you now have to deal with. Um, so I would, I, would, uh, I would be very hesitant to recommend that we, we just be jabbing these vitreous hemorrhages with, with, uh, with uh, anti vegf unless you had seen the patient before, you know the state of the retina. If you don't know the state of the retina, uh, be very careful with giving anti -VEGF. Unless you are giving anti -VEGF and you know you're going to vitroctomize that patient within maybe a month, or you're ready to take the consequences. So it, it, is, it is very, um, what's the word? Uh, very, it, it, it's very inviting to give anti -VEGF because you, vitreous hemorrhage does clear, but then we have seen some traction detachment that uh, that have been very nasty because you know some people gave a few antivages with a vitreous hemorrhage with no view. Sometimes you have a vitreous hemorrhage, but if you look in the periphery, you can see the retina, and you can see this retina looks fairly healthy. But if you don't have a retinal view, and please don't trust your your bis biscan because you can have flat fibrovascular membranes and you miss them. So I think my comment to my colleagues is. In a vitreous hemorrhage, unless you've seen the patient before, you've lasered the patient, you know there are no membranes, then you can give. But if you don't know, uh, try and keep away from anti and, and unless you're ready to, or rather you've counseled the patient that they'll need a vitrectomy fairly quickly. Uh, I, I would value what my other colleagues. Yeah, I, I think for the kind of case where you're talking now, early vitreous hemorrhage, you can see the fundus clearly, you're sure there are no membranes, then an injection can be useful because you're sure there's no membranes. But in the case of a persistent vitreous hemorrhage, very poor view of the fundus, and you suspect or know it's a vascular occlusion since that's what we are discussing today, I would, I, I would give a pre-op avastin or anti of whichever nature, whether it's like ilea or lucentis or whatever. Give it and then, but to operate, I usually do four days. Some people give it a week. I've seen some wait two weeks, but anywhere, depending on who you are, where what you've read, between four days and two weeks, where you're injecting it with the intention to go into surgery to reduce your intraop bleeding, then that can be justified if you don't have a clear view of the fundus. But if you have no view, yeah, giving it can be can be can be dangerous. And I've also seen a few cases referred where there were vitreous hemorrhages, and people gave the standard three injections. Um, the standard three injections that we give is usually for macular edemas and AMDs. When it comes to vitreous hemorrhages, we usually don't prescribe that standard three injections till the vitreous hemorrhage clears. When it comes to vitreous hemorrhage, I'd usually do a maximum of one. If I don't see any change, whether it's because of a vascular occlusion of diabetes, then it's time to probably go for a vitrectomy not repeatedly injecting till hopefully the vitreous hemorrhage clears, especially if you cannot see what's happening behind that vitreous hemorrhage. Good. Now, there's, um, I wanted to ask about, have you seen cases of recurrent uh, central retinal vascular occlusions? Because I had a case like that once where we kept injecting because of the macular edema, only to realize that when you examine a bit closer, this patient was actually having recurrent CRVOs. It wasn't persistent edema. It was recurrent. She kept occluding and occluding and occluding. And uh, eventually it was found to have, the patient was found to have polycythemia. Have you seen that for other conditions? And what would be your recommendation in that case of recurrent CRVO as opposed to chronic macular edema or poor response to anti vegf treatment? I think my comment, I will give a case, a, a real life example. A patient was sent to me, a Mzungu patient, a young patient. I saw them around 5, 5 p.m. and I was really going home. And she had been to three other colleagues and had gotten three other diagnoses. So she, I was the fourth patient. And she just had, she was very young. She had just a small capillary block 
near the macula, uh, like, a, 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 like a level four branch retinal vein occlusion, which I found very odd. So I told her, look, um, you know, this is what it is. Your macula is still fine. It's just one vessel. Um, but you are rather young and it's a bit concerning. Why are you getting? Let's just do a routine blood, uh, you know, nothing dramatic. Just full blood count and you are need. The next thing I knew, it was the next day, 24 hours later, I got a call from the US embassy telling me, informing me that my patient has been flown to the US as an emergency, uh, just out of point of information. So I asked them, what, what happened? They said, well, the full blood count showed that uh, she had platelets of like uh, four times the normal. Um, so so, so the, the point here is, um, I think for all vascular occlusions, as Mushai mentioned, please remember this is a systemic issue. Please do the basics, do the basic workups. And, uh, and, 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 and also please let the physician know that this is what you found. Because once you do the basic, at least a U and E liver function, full blood count, you, you start picking up very strange things. So that, that's, I didn't bring that point, but that, that's a very important point. Any vascular occlusion, remember that is a systemic thing. And I think there's a study that showed that the, the, the cardiac, or is it the stroke? I think the incident of stroke once you have a retinal vein occlusion goes up three times. So, so that's a major takeaway point. Um, this is a systemic issues and please look at it that way as well. Uh, as for repeated, I, I'm not sure. I think the patient I remember it was your patient. So I don't think I've seen a patient myself. <laughs> All right. Now, a comment here from uh, the father of ROP, uh, Dr. Oscar Onyango. Um, there's a comment about the systemic effects of anti VEGF, given the presentation you made on reducing vitreous hemorrhage in the other eye and the other case of reducing macular edema. And so it comes to the challenge when you're dealing with very tiny babies with the retinopathy of prematurity, we are giving Avastin or Lucentis and you give the injections and you know the baby is still developing a lot of the vital organs, needs VEGF actually for the development of those organs and you're now giving anti-VEGF into the eye. Um, so I think he's just posing it as a word of caution. How much do you actually give for these babies? Typically, I think we give half the dose. Um, so you know, just the judicial use of anti-VEGF in children because the systemic effects, as you can see, they are so drastic in a full grown adult. Imagine in a tiny little baby premature, many of them are in the range of one to two kilos, then you could potentially have pretty significant systemic side effects with the babies. Uh, and therefore still keep your minds open to lasers and other treatment modalities for retinopathy or prematurity. All right, I think we have gone through all the questions that have been posted and a couple of comments thereafter saying, excellent presentation, Dr. Kibata. So thank you, Dr. Tari, for taking your time to prepare those cases. Anyone who's done case presentations knows how much effort it takes to put those scans together, put the, you know, the narratives together and put them into a logical story that we can all listen to and learn from. So we appreciate that effort, Dr. Tari, and thank you very much for sharing those wonderful cases. Uh, I will throw the presentation back to Agnes Kalu, uh, and then you'll tell us if you have a word from the sponsor and uh, wrap the meeting up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mushai, Dr. Kibata. That was a very um, awesome presentation and stimulating conversation. We have really enjoyed it. Um, we are going to have a small word from our sponsors today, and that will be done by Romeo, um, then I will uh, come back and we close the meeting for the day. Thank you. Romeo. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kibata. I think that's uh, quite a wonderful presentation. Um, also grateful to, the, uh, to all healthcare professionals here for attending this, this meeting. I think it's been quite informative during these times um, of COVID, just being able to learn more and more um, in this kind of space. Um, I don't have much to say as, as always on, on, on uh, after such a good presentation, maybe just to mention about ILEA is um, we keep on thinking about uh, the um, unique mode of action, um, quite unique multi-target trap is and the only anti-VEGF that we, we have currently and blocks all VEGFR ligands, including VEGF 
and placental growth factor, which basically when elevated correlates to severity of, the, of diabetic eye diseases. I think uh, quite a number of um, healthcare, healthcare professionals here have used, uh, doctors you have used, you have used ILEA. And um, what I can mention is in regards to the outcomes is about this superior visual acuity, acuity gains um, to the patients. And at the end of it, I think it's about the quality of life. There's quite some improved quality of life. The visual acuity gains sustained over time will definitely translate into meaningful improvements in their day-to-day -day living. Um, ILEA is available in East Africa, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, um, Tanzania, Burundi, and Ethiopia. And currently we have quite worked on the pricing and right now it is retailing at 37,000 shillings a vial. So yes, ILEA is available and we're looking forward to more interactions with you. Um, Bayer is willing to sponsor any kind of a meeting that will enhance uh, healthcare professional knowledge. So thank you for this opportunity, the Ophthalmological Society of Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Romeo, for keeping for keeping that short. And thank you for reminding us about ILEA. Though today we've learned quite a lot and a lot of the patients were getting better with ILEA. So we hope to get the opportunity to use for those of us who are not, um, uh, not have not been able to get a chance or to have it available near us. Um, before we come to the end of the day, I want to remind us to uh, send the name, your name and name of your institution to the host on this chat for purposes of CPD points for our Kenyan colleagues. Um, also, our next CME will be on 8th of April, and we are going to dive to matters uh, pediatrics. Um, lastly, I would like to wish all of us a happy Easter for those of us who are going to enjoy the Easter whether in lockdown or out of the lockdown counties. Enjoy it, uh, keep safe, and uh, let's meet again on 8th of April. Thank you, have a good evening.